to our audience so that we can watch it and then we'll get started. I will mute myself and look forward to your program. Yeah, I would say to start with that NOVA is always excellent. That's the nature of the quality of the operation of NOVA. It's always excellent. PVC can be better and, and not better. The old uh, A&E series, Mysteries of the Bible, that I was in constantly was both a lot of fun and uh, rather, uh, rather interesting to do. And uh, I just have to say that actually it's been a great privilege to be able to talk to a lot of people. I remember the night of the first night I was on NOVA, that di documentary, which is still a great documentary, went on the night that Clarence Thomas was being voted for. And the thing was going on on Channel 13, which is the same, PBS was doing it. And NOVA told them, if you don't end this by 8 o'clock, we're, we're turning you off. So that is what caused them to have to vote when they voted so that they could finish in time for our program. But when I realized there were 18 million people watching that program, it, it had a whole different effect on my understanding of what it means to talk to the public. Don't worry, I'm not nervous that you don't have 100, you know, 18 million people here, but actually it's very nice to be able to talk to your group and the extra people that were able to get on because we're on this medium of Zoom. And if I would have come out to California, I would have gotten some airline miles, right? Killed three days every time for the lecture, two days each lecture, right? Six days I would have killed. And I would have met you, all the people from California, it would have been very nice to meet you in person. And I know there's some old friends that are actually on here. I just you know, looked at some of the names. But having said that, this is a way with which we get an even bigger group. So uh, it's, it's really nice to be with you. And I don't know if you want to say any more in introduction or I should get started, but I'm, we're all ready here to get started. And we're going to be speaking today, Dead Sea Scrolls and the New Testament. We're going to have to give a little bit of review on some questions of New Testament so that people will know what's going on here. There basically have been historically three approaches to this problem since the discovery of the scrolls in 1947. It has a prehistory in terms of the so-called Damascus document or Sadakite fragments that was found in some manuscripts in the Cairo Geniza, that collection of manuscripts, which are medieval manuscripts. There is a prehistory to this discussion about the connection of the Essenes and early Christianity. We won't have time for that today. We're really starting our story with the 47 and discovery. And with the 47 discovery, there were immediately three basic approaches. The first one that we're, I'm going to mention to you is the one we're not really going to talk about at all, which is the Dead Sea Scrolls are Christian. And of course, this is total nonsense. The date of the material, as we know, we'll explain in a minute uh, what we do to date this material, proves that it's pre-Christian, and it's basically nonsense. And it's nonsense, which is often linked up with the idea that the scrolls could prove or disprove Christianity, and uh, this stuff sells books. It even is the intro to some of the documentaries that I've been in where they have some crazy things put forward by some nice people with very strange ideas. And then they have uh, people like me telling why they're wrong. And while that is a way that people make videos, it's not really telling the truth about what happened. So I could spend hours talking about this craziness, but that wouldn't really help you to understand the scrolls. And it would be of no value to you beyond laughing at some of the silliness. Now, the second approach is way oversimplified. The Dead Sea Scrolls, it would be assumed, and it is the majority of the theory, of theory that they are from the sect of the Essenes, even though I indicated some hesitations. There was the majority theory. And what people then did was to simply assume that these are proto-Christians. I actually uh, joked at a lecture I was at years ago, I was privileged to be a member of the committee arranging the 50th, 60th, and 70th Dead Sea Scrolls conferences uh, at, for the, the anniversary conferences that we had in Jerusalem. And at the 50th, somebody gave a lecture and I made a wisecrack afterwards. This guy sounds like a bunch of Essenes got onto a bus at Qumran and rode on that bus to a church with the leadership of the Apostle John and simply transferred their teaching to the book of John in the, in the Gospels. And this is, of course, nonsense. Any type of assumption in which the Dead Sea Scrolls sectarians feed directly into some specific gospel or type of Christianity is nonsense. Rather, what I put in bold here, which is obviously correct, and it's part of the title of my book, the subtitle of my book, Reclaiming the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
what I put there is that it's the background that the Dead Sea Scrolls and many other Second Temple sources explain the background against which Christianity develops. Now, I always use a funny analogy. And from looking around at who's on here, many of you will remember there used to be such a thing as a switchboard. And I know when I was a kid and we went to a hotel, we got a kick out of watching the switchboard operator pulling the plugs in, putting the plugs. Now, you remember there was an ad on TV and it shows this switchboard operator who can't connect to everybody. It's too fast. And they take get rid of this and get a computerized system. Well, I want to tell you that what happened in antiquity is like that switchboard. Because what happened is that different aspects of the different Second Temple communities, the known sects, Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, Dead Sea Scrolls, and groups that we never even heard of, all fed crosswise and partly and this way and that way into what eventually is the result of all this, the rise on the one hand of rabbinic Judaism of the Mishnah and, and the Talmud, which became the basis for all subsequent Judaism, as well as the rise of Christianity. So that is why we will not see direct connections. We will see indirect connections of the kind that actually are typical of cultural development. And this is a very important thing to realize. If, for example, someone wants to speak about what are the influences on contemporary American literature. They wouldn't assume that there's some school of say 17th century British literature that simply dumped itself into some group of American authors. Life doesn't work that way. And in, I think that when you think about this, I always say this, there's one place where anachronism is correct in making scholarly judgment. And that is where we're talking about human nature. People absorb trends and ideas from a variety of sources, and they bring them together. And that is certainly going to be the case with what we are studying today. Now, we have to make a few statements right out at the beginning. There are no New Testament texts at Qumran. In 1970-something, you may have read a ridiculous article in the New York Times claiming that a piece of the Book of Mark had been found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it was a Greek fragment that had one word. Now, if we were in person, or if you wouldn't have to do this, but if we turned off all the mutes and we asked everybody, what do you think that word is? No one is ever going to guess. It's the word and. Now, could you believe someone based on the word and, Kai in Greek, would actually think that they can identify a text as a New Testament? And yet, by amending the Gospel of Mark and calculating line lengths about a few fragmentary letters, that ridiculous claim was made. Further, Jesus and John the Baptist lived after the composition of the text and the copying of most of them. So they're not in the scrolls. Now, people ask me, was Jesus ever at Qumran? And as I say jokingly, I don't know when the man went on vacation. I can't tell you if he was ever at Qumran, just like I can't tell you if he was ever in Haifa. But what I can tell you is there is no evidence of any direct influence of the scrolls on him. And John the Baptist, who was, according to some New Testament traditions, a, an influence on Jesus, but according to others, is disconnected from him. John the Baptist, while he has in parallel with the scrolls, the idea of baptism, which is really immersion in a mikvah, for an immersion in a river, for a transition and initiation. That's a parallel with the scroll, but there's no evidence that he directly was connected. None of the core Christian beliefs is in the scrolls, because the, for the scrolls, yes, they believe in an immediate messianism, but they don't believe the Messiah has come. I got to qualify that a little bit, because a scroll sect does believe that the transition is happening, but yet they don't believe that a messianic figure has arisen. And there is, of course, no acceptance of an idea like incarnation. As sectarian as the sectarians are, their theology is the one that people would say, if I stopped the one of you on the street and said to you, tell me, or called the opposite, what are the basic beliefs of Judaism? And it's one, one God, he created the universe, right? This kind of stuff, right? That he commanded people to be good people. They, would, they, they all agreed about this. Now, how do we know when I make a statement that these texts all originated before Christianity. How do we know? Now, if you are having an archaeology lecture, and I, I, I hope you will, because uh, it was mentioned a little bit in some of the gabbing before one of our lectures here, you'll find out that, first of all, one of the ways we date things is by archaeological layers. 
And I probably should probably should type in, if I do this lecture again, numismatics, because for archaeology, we use coins to date layers, especially in a period when there are coins. Obviously, you can't do that if you're doing First Temple. There's no coins. But once coins come into being, they're dated by the rulers. So in Qumran, we have the dating of the archaeological layers. Then we have paleography, the history of the script. But paleography, which people question, has been proven by the selective carbon-14 dating of some manuscripts. And as that has gone on, increasingly, we find out that the pre-Christian dating is correct. So, for example, there was one text that some people thought pictured Jesus' death. Now, it was nonsense, because according to this text, the person who died in the text was the wicked priest who had attacked the leader of the sect, who's called the teacher of righteousness. But don't ask me how they got that crazy theory, but nonetheless, the text carbon-14 dated to 145 BCE. And we know that these dates are plus or minus 25 years, not what was when I was in high school, and they told us plus or minus 200 years. Now it's plus or minus 25 years of the work, the material we're doing. So at any rate, the real question, as we say, is how do the scrolls illumine the background of Christianity? Not some kind of, oh, by the way, I want to tell you something funny. If you'll go and you'll tell your friends about this lecture, half of them will tell you, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. The Dead Sea Scrolls are Christian. One time I got a call from somebody from a radio station. The woman was doing the prep before an interview. They have these stringer people that call you up and they talk to you. So she says, I don't understand. If you're a scholar of Judaism, why do they invite you to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls? So I was like, you know, confused. Like, what are you talking about? I mean, they're Jewish scrolls. So, oh, no, I thought they're Christian. Well, but I've had people tell even my students that they don't know what they're talking about because there's a lot of hype and it sells books. Here's a funny story. I'm looking at my watch to make sure I have time. So Donna Shear, who now runs the University of Nebraska Press, was, she won't mind my telling this story. She was the marketing director of Jewish Publication Society when they published my book, Reclaiming the Dead Sea Scrolls, in 1994. She was on a bus coming from Masada, and they passed Qumran. And the Israeli guide said, there's Qumran where Christianity started. She ran up from the front of the bus and said to her, how can you say such a thing? And here was almost verbatim the answer. There are more Christians on the bus than Jews. Well, there are more Christians in the United States and in the English reading populace than Jews. And so there are a lot of books that have baloney claiming things that are false about the scrolls. We have to remind ourselves before we start, especially in this audience, a little bit about the dating of the New Testament works. The earliest of the Gospels is Mark, about the time of the destruction of the temple. The other books range up to about 100 CE. Now, Matthew and Luke have some common material that comes from what scholars call the Q source, from German Quelle, which means source, not Yiddish Quelle, German Quelle. And German Quelle, the source, is an assumption that there was a common source that would have to go back to some time between Mark and the datings we give here or some other approximate datings. This is all approximate. No one knows 100%. And the Acts of the Apostles that have some parallels are to the 80s or 90s. But now, the reason I'm really showing you this is because of a strange fact, which is that the Pauline epistles, now if you open a New Testament, there are some epistles that are not by Paul. But the ones that are by Paul are approximately between 50, 55, 57. And this means that they are earlier than the completed Gospels that tell the story of the church developing in the land of Israel. But, very important point, those Gospels have sources that go back to soon after the crucifixion, which is probably in 30 or 31, and the sources that go back to soon after were oral traditions. And many of these oral traditions have parallels to things here or there, or can be compared and contrasted with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Because let me just tell you, I opened up a very fine book, I'm not going to tell you which book, that I like about the Dead Sea Scrolls to look at the chapter at the end of Christ about Christianity and the Scrolls. And once again, I was disappointed that it is simply an assemblage of a few parallels. We need not only to compare, but to contrast, and we need to have a sense of context. 
And that's what I hope to do with our time today. Now, one of the key discussions revolves around the rule of the community. By the way, I hope I'm keeping my promise of no slide that you saw before. I hope so, right? So the rule of the community where we had seen last time, actually, that there was a manuscript from the first cave, cave one at Qumran, with a virtually complete text of this rule. But the rule of the community is an extremely important text for the question we're talking about, because it tells us the nature of function of the set. Now, the sectarians have here a very opposite way with some parallels to early Christianity. First of all, the sectarians have initiation rites. You have to rise in levels of ritual purity to join the group, and you have to pass tests. Christianity sought to be, at least if you read the New Testament, it looks this way, an open group where a preacher sought to associate with him those of his fellow Jews who wanted to join with his teachings. And there was no exclusivity. In fact, there are polemics in the New Testament against exclusivity and kinds of super piety. Now, furthermore, and I actually didn't list this here just by mistake, that there is, I did this, this is a new lecture, actually, the way I put this together. I had some old notes, but they didn't match for this series. So you're looking at the new rethinking the last uh, week on how to do it. So I'll have to put it in next time. And that is the question of the New Testament's outright rejection of using purity law, ritual purity and impurity as a boundary. And the New Testament polemicizes against that several times. And the initiation rites of the sect are based on Jewish purity law and rising higher and higher in level of purity. And here you have to remember that not only this group, but the Sadducees and the uh, various other Jewish groups, an inner core group of the Pharisees, were the forerunners of the rabbis, lived not only the way purity had to be done for the temple, but practice those purity regulations. And we're not just talking about ritual purity in marriage. They practice the purity of food and all kinds of things that the priests used to do in the temple in their daily life. Now also, and here's another story, you have the idea of the attitude to outsiders. The Dead Sea Scroll sect literally hate outsiders. And I was giving a lecture in Concordia University, where unlike, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, who was chased off the stage there by some enemies of Israel, I actually received a very nice welcome. That was one of the unfortunate events that happened around uh, a confusion between trying to voice your opinion about something and chasing people away from speaking. But when I spoke, I had a very nice reception. I remember there was a minister who asked me during the question period, well, how do you really know these guys aren't proto-Christians? And I read him the passage from this rule of the community that you should hate outsiders. And of course, this is against the teachings of Pharisaic Judaism. And I'll tell you right now that the ethics of Christianity is the ethics of Pharisaic Judaism, not of these types of sects. And the sect believes literally the Hebrew word sane, to hate, is used for outsiders. Now, we all know the Torah says you shall not hate your brother in your heart. It's forbidden, according to Judaism, to hate people. Okay, I mean, you want to hate Adolf Hitler or somebody like that. You know, Saddam Hussein, but I'm saying, normally we don't, we believe it's completely forbidden to hate people. So this whole attitude to outsiders. Also, now here's a parallel. According to the church description of the early church in the book of Acts, and by the way, Acts was, according to virtually all scholars, written by the same author as the Gospel of Luke. It's a continuation. And according to Acts, the communal property was practiced by the early church as it is practiced by the Qumran sectarians. Now also, the Qumran sectarians had communal meals. There was developing in early Christianity, mostly even after the time of the New Testament, communal meals. Actually, communal meals were competing with the mass as the basic ritual in early Christianity. Communal meals fell apart, and the mass made it, but AK. Now also, Christians, of course, like the Dead Sea Scroll sectarians, were involved in worship of God. And though the sect emphasized study of the Torah, and we don't get that message in the New Testament. Now we've already talked about this question in relationship to the Essenes, the Dead Sea Scrolls may be the Essenes. Scholars think the Essenes may have been an influence, but they're not mentioned in the New Testament. 
they're not mentioned in the Talmud, and we don't know what the word means. So who knows? I can't really tell you that. Now, the question of celibacy is really big. It, Paul argues in uh, 2 Corinthians that the best thing to do is not to be married. But if you can't handle that without violating the assumption of celibacy, then you should be married. And of course, he's against all non-marital sexual relations. So they, there are scholars who believe that the Dead Sea sectarians were celibate because the rule of the community doesn't mention women. And I probably told you my joke already about how what great American document doesn't mention women, the Constitution, and of course, the people who wrote it weren't celibate. But having said that, right, the, there are no women, well, there are almost no women in the cemetery at Qumran, and they're only buried in a separate cemetery. And furthermore, when it comes to celibacy, or if there would be celibacy, I don't know, there are no gendered female things, not, I shouldn't say no, that's exaggerated, almost no gendered female things in the archaeological finds. So it seems that only men lived at Qumran. Now, if you believe that the sectarians were celibate, then you would conclude that this is a legitimate parallel to Pauline views. This is a big question. It's still being argued because many of the sects, other than the rule of the community, speak about marriage and have all kinds of information about marriage, how you should choose a wife, who should choose a wife, all these things. So it's hard to understand this as celibate. Finally, as I mentioned, it's important to realize that the sectarian life not only can be compared in a few small ways to the church described in Acts, but it's very similar to the Chavura, which in case you know that term from some contemporary Jewish uses, is originally a group of sort of proto pharisaic people who joined together to observe purity laws within the context of the pharisaic tradition, which of course becomes the basis of Talmudic Judaism. Okay, now I want to look at some texts. So one I'd like to look with you is this whole literature of Pesha. Pesha is contemporizing interpretation. Here you see a nice piece of the Pesha of Isaiah. Now, specifically, Pesha has parallels to certain things about the fulfillment passages in the New Testament. That's what it says in the Gospels. They quote some verse from the Hebrew Bible, understood by Christians or termed by Christians the Old Testament. And then they immediately say this comes to fulfill, it's about the life of Jesus, comes to fulfill such and such prophecy. Now forget the argument that Jews don't believe that the prophecies were fulfilled. Leave that aside completely. To the Christian writer and reader, they are making a claim that these prophets are talking about their own time. Now in the scrolls, there's Peshare commentary on parts of the 12 minor prophets and also Isaiah and Psalms. By the way, they're not minor because they're unimportant, they're minor because they're small. Okay, the most popular books in the New Testament are Isaiah and Psalms, and they have the most manuscripts in the Dead Sea Scroll. Now this contemporizing interpretation teaches us a lot of really interesting historical things, because here we learn by certain reading of code words, etc., about the history of the sect. And we realize here that they had a leader at the beginning called the teacher of righteousness, not the real beginning, let's say soon after the beginning, of the teacher of righteousness, I don't know, about 120 BCE, something like that. And this teacher was pursued. Now, many scholars have posed parallels between this teacher and Jesus. Now, there are parallels because they are individuals who taught a group religiously in Judea in the period which is one in the second century BCE and one in the first century CE. So there are some parallels, just as there are parallels between Jesus and the rabbis and various other known figures. But they are certainly not the same person, which some people try to claim. Now, there's a big difference, however, because Peshir has this ideology of double prophecy. What do we double prophecy? The prophet was inspired by God, and the teacher is inspired to interpret the words of the prophet. And only with the teacher's interpretation can you understand the truth. And that is very different from the Christian point of view. They quote a verse and they say, well, anybody can tell that this is a fulfillment. Now, anybody can tell. We might not agree with that. But they, their assumption is that it's all exoteric, not esoteric hidden. 
But nonetheless, there is a serious comparison here with New Testament fulfillment passages. The truth is, almost every example I'm giving you now is from something I published in a scholarly paper. I want to make one thing clear. I'm not telling anywhere near the whole story today. There's no time, just as we didn't tell the whole story in any lecture here. So the bottom line is, I, I did choose things on which I've done some research. And I think these are important things. A few things I took that I didn't research, but the reality of the situation is that the comparisons that have been made are important, but they are limited because as I say, it's not exactly the same thing. Here is a little sample of text. And what I wanna call your attention to is after quoting this verse on the top line, you can sort of skim over it quickly. You'll see the discussion in the first paragraph about the people who are running the show in Jerusalem. They drink too much, they have parties, they have music playing, and they don't regard the work of the Lord or see the deeds of his hands. And this, of course, he's talking, they're talking about their enemies with a priest running the temple in Jerusalem, and they're saying they're going to go basically to Sheol, the, 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 the underworld. And then, who are you talking about here? They identify, these are the scoffers in Jerusalem. The scoffers are the enemies of the sect in various places, right? And, and Hebrew, they're called the Anshe Latzon, the people of, scoff, of scoffing. Now, this is just a sample, but it shows you the way in which they understand the prophet to be talking about their own day and those who prophesied against or for the destruction of those who are their enemies. Now, the document called the Damascus document that had first surfaced in medieval manuscripts in the Cairo Geniza, and is now available to us in about 10 fragmentary manuscripts from Qumran, which doubled the size of the document because we only had part of it. We didn't know that, but it's, it's, it's obviously true. We only had part of the document. So it has in it a Sabbath code. Now here we want to get to the fact that this document has a lot of parallels with rabbinic halacha. Now, anyone who has read the New Testament gospels will know that Jesus is pictured as arguing with the Pharisees about Sabbath observance. And there are a variety of arguments, and I only want to talk about one. I want to talk about what happens when an animal falls into a pit. Now, I have to tell you, animals falling into pits sounds to us like, what are you talking about? We're talking about now a pit where the animal might die because there's water in the pit. So animals falling into pits is a regular problem. I don't think we face it, too many of us, but uh, who knows who's on our watching us today, we may have a farmer who does chase this issue, but we don't face it. But at any rate, it's a serious problem. What do you do on the Sabbath? Can you violate the Sabbath to save the animal? So I want to point out, I'm just going to show you two laws from Damascus document. In between, there's another 15 or 20. But the first one I show you, just because you can see here, they started Shabbat on Friday night, a little bit before the Sabbath. They quoted the verse from the Ten Commandments, observe the Sabbath day to, sa to, to, to sanctify it. It's basically what you would expect of a Jewish group. Basically, they start Shabbat a little bit earlier, as Jews do in every community where candle lighting is anywhere between, depending, Jerusalem is 40 minutes before. Some communities is 30 minutes. In America, everybody starts 18 minutes before. Okay. But now look at the law on the bottom here. No one should deliver an animal on the Sabbath day. If it falls into a deliver means deliver birth, help it to give birth. If it fall into a sister of a pit, one may not lift it out on the Sabbath. Now you should know that this discussion goes on in the New Testament because Jesus says to the Pharisees, well, who here wouldn't lift up his animal out of a pit if it fell into the pit on Shabbat? Remember, where the animal's life is at risk. Now the Mishnah discusses this case too. The Mishnah, the rabbinic text, says that if your animal falls into a pit on Shabbat, you may not violate Shabbat to save it, but you could bring some pillows or things and put them there so that the animal will succeed in climbing out. But you're not allowed to catch the animal and remove him directly. So my point about this example is that there are three positions being stated here. The very liberal position of the early Christians that's put in the mouth of Jesus by the gospel. The position of the rabbis is a middle position. Get the animal out without violating Shabbat. And the position, of, or by the way, if it's possible just to feed the animal there, and if it's still safe, you can leave them there. But if it's not safe, you get them out. But don't violate Shabbat to do that. And the position of the Christians, just take them out. So what you see here is that, and this is an example of the problem of comparing halachic views in the New Testament in which Jesus takes the very liberal position with the ones in the scroll. 
Generally, here's the rule, and I just gave you one example. The scrolls are what they would call in today's Jewish terms on the right, the most strict, the Pharisees, which become the Mishnah in the middle, and the uh, Christians on the left, the most liberal. And of course, this eventually leads Christianity to abandon the whole halachic Jewish law system. But here you see an example of this disagreement on an issue where the whole exact same issue is discussed in all of our sources. It's great to have the New Testament to throw into this discussion. Now I want to pass over to an example from the Temple School. I think I mentioned to you last time, it's my favorite scroll, because I just completed the third book in which I'm a partner in completing a new edition of the Temple Scroll, which is theoretically in press, but they're supposed to show us a sample and it's taken months to figure out how to typeset this complicated edition. And uh, here you see some of the fragmentary sections of the scroll where the scroll deteriorated considerably as obviously you could tell you looking at columns 19, 20, and 21, it's a 66 column scroll. And I can tell you it's absolutely a fascinating document which rewrites the Torah. But I show it here to you today to make the point that here that sacrifice and priesthood are understood very differently in the New Testament and in the scroll. The Temple Scroll, which is probably a pre-Dead Sea Scrolls document for the most part, its sources are there from before the sect came into being, but it represents a Sadducee priestly-like idea of Jewish law. Now, it's also similar to the MMT document we mentioned last time and various other texts of the scrolls, but you have to understand this text calls for a gigantic temple with a third courtyard to increase the sanctity of the temple. And it like the prophet Ezekiel, or at least what's at the end of the book of Ezekiel, and like King Herod who built the temple mount that you see today when you go to the Western Wall. So these people wanted expanded temples. And that's what the temple scroll tried to do. But now this is in total contrast with the spiritualization of the temple in the New Testament in which temple and sacrifice, you can see this tremendously in the epistle to the Hebrews. In the epistle to the Hebrews, there is a whole idea that Jesus becomes not only the high priest, but the sacrifice himself. When that happens, the whole sense of sacrifice as a form of human worship goes away, because what the person identified as the son of God in Christianity is now sacrificed. And so this is just a total transmog transmogrification of the idea of sacrifice in Judaism. Now, furthermore, Jesus in the scrolls is pictured as opposed to the temple. I'm sorry, Jesus in the New Testament. First of all, because of the famous money changer episode. Now, the money changers were there, so somebody who brought a big coin because he couldn't schlep small coins from his house in the Galilee somewhere could buy a sacrifice. So this poor guy comes down with $1,000 bill, and he's got to change it so that he can buy a sacrifice for $20. I think the idea of considering this immoral makes no sense. This is something that was a regular part of life. But Jesus opposed it. It doesn't matter whether the story really happened. What matters is that the New Testament pictures it that way. Early Christianity understands him. But more than that, he prophesies the destruction of the temple. So clearly, this is very, very different from the way the temple is understood by the scrolls and the way the temple is understood later in the Mishnah and Talmud as the place of holiness in which Jews can communicate with God. Now, of course, Jesus does have some positive inter interchanges with the temple when as a child he's pictured as teaching Torah there and other things like that. But the reality is that as a whole, the attitude to sacrifice in the scrolls and the New Testament is radically different. And here I just presented you a little text here, which this is from the Temple Scroll, column 29. And it's a point where the point that's being made in this text when you move down to lines 8, 9, 10, is that the temple is an eternal thing, which God has placed until the time of the coming of the Messiah. That's called the day of blessing here, when he's going to recreate a divine temple. And all of this is assumption that this is the way Jews should be worshiping in the optimal situation. And this is radically different than the move first away from sacrifice and then away from Jewish ritual later on, starting with Paul and then continuing certainly in antiquity after Paul's period, because Paul is certainly, he's dead by the time, executed in Rome, by the time that the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls uh, have been uh, 
you know, I'm sorry, by the time that the, that the temple is destroyed, Jesus has already been executed. But you can see here the positive emphasis on the temple as a way of worshiping God. Now, an interesting parallel comes up in the Thanksgiving scroll, the Horayot scroll, because this scroll is some form of either liturgical or devotional poetry. There's a lot of debate in the field. Was it used for prayer? Beautiful, beautiful poems. But it has some things that are very strange uh, to Judaism, and some of which are strange to Christianity. So one of them is predestination. Now, I know the Calvinists are predestined. But most Christians, like most Jews, don't believe in predestination. They believe that God can interfere, but usually leaves it up to us. So we're having this conversation today because we chose, not because we were predestined to do this. A sectarian in Quran, and it's clear from this Hodayot Thanksgiving scroll, would believe that you are here now because God decided you should be and I should be here. And that is not a normal Jewish idea or a Christian idea. However, the document in question does talk a lot about the persecution of the teacher and the sect. So here you do have some parallel to what later happened in the history of Christianity. But where the real parallel comes is to Paul, who emphasizes tremendously the opposition of the flesh and the spirit. And it's quite common in this document, along with negative attitudes to the physical body, especially of women, where the reproductive organs of women are described in a way that if I said it, there would be somebody claiming that I'm a, you know, a misogynist or something. You have to be careful. I once was giving a lecture, and I read some anti-Christian material as an example of some things that were said in some Jewish polemics. And somebody wrote in and said that I was anti-Christian, you know, and caused a whole issue, right? So you don't have to be careful what you read. But anyhow, you take a look at this little excerpt. It's a very small excerpt. And in this very small excerpt, you could see that there is, on the one hand, predestination. But look at this stuff. Thy mighty deeds to all the living. What is flesh to be worthy of this? The creature of clay, of, of clay right? And who's guilty all the time. The idea that everybody's a sinner. That's also a piece of Paul. And then at the bottom, you see that the abundance of his mercy is towards all the sons of his grace. The significance of divine grace not just that we can earn merit, which is a fundamental principle of Judaism, but Christianity, certainly the uh, Pauline Christianity, believes that humans actually can't succeed, that the commandments cannot be succeeded in by Jews, that they are designed to, in such a way as Jews would fail to keep them, and therefore only God's grace makes it possible to be in connection with him. And this point of view is an example of a parallel to Pauline Christianity. What we don't know is whether Paul got his ideas from somehow these texts indirectly, or most of Paul's works are written outside the land of Israel, or whether possibly he got some of these ideas from the Hellenistic Jewish environment, which uh, influenced him in many ways. Uh, I'm not gonna try and hazard even a guess. I'm not a scholar of Paul. I've read some of the major works, but I'm not gonna guess which way, but it's an interesting parallel for you to realize does exist. I hope you're getting the point that we do have some yes parallel and we have some yes, very, very big contrasts. And that's what we mean when we say it illumines the background, but you can't, so to speak, pin the development of Christianity on the Dead Sea Scroll. Now, when we go to the question of apocalypticism and messianism, apocalypticism has many definitions. I'm just going to stick with an easy one. We want the Messiah now. That's the apocalyptic immediacy of messianism. Not that it's out there somewhere it can happen if human beings do some good things, but no. We want it has to be immediate. Christianity shares with these people a belief that the Messiah is going to come very soon. But it also shares something else, which is the idea which it shares with the revolutionaries, even though Christianity was not involved, contrary to some scholars, in actual revolution, but it shares with the revolutionaries who eventually caused the war of 66 to 73 and destruction of the temple. It shares the idea with them of immediacy, but it has a lot of differences. So let's just start by understanding that in the Dead Sea Scroll, there are two approaches to the messianic figures. There's the idea of two mess of one Messiah who's the son of David. That's typical Judaism, and it has an influence, maybe through scrolls, but in general it's Judaism, on Christianity, because of course you know that um, Christ Jesus is 
uh, Jesus is traced back through the Davidic line to be legitimated as Messiah, despite the fact that he's traced through Joseph, who according to the New Testament is actually not his father. But nonetheless, he's traced through Joseph to be a son of David. The second Qumran theory, which heightens the idea of the significance of the rebuilt temple, or the temple actually, because it was functioning in their time, even though they disagreed with the way it's being run, is the two Messiah theory. There you have a Messiah of Aaron, who is Aaron the high priest, and therefore this high priest to be is the most important figure in the entire scenario of the Messianic era. And then there's an Israel Messiah who handles the temporal government, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are two competing messianic views in the scrolls. And I think personally that members of the sect have different opinions, just like the people on, on this lecture. People have different opinions about many things. They won't even try to list any of them, but you have all different opinions. Obviously, the, everybody on this lecture will not vote for the same presidential candidate. However, right, the reality is that uh, these are the two positions. Now, Christianity picks up on the son of David for the most part, but there are reflections of the priestly Messiah idea in the epistle to the Hebrews, where Jesus is the sort of the arch high priest of a heavenly temple where he himself gets sacrificed, but leave that aside. But he's the arch high priest while also being the sacrifice. Now, the Qumran sectarians, however, expect a gigantic messianic war. So let me take a minute to explain. There are two approaches to messianism in Judaism. There is the restorative naturalistic. That's what most people who believe in a messianic era in today's Jewish community think, that if human beings will make the world better and better, bring about peace, and some leader will emerge to make that happen, that the messianic era can be brought about in that manner. That is a restorative idea to restore the theoretically wonderful thing that used to exist in the time of King David, whether it was so perfect is another matter, but the assumption that there's a wonderful past that has to be restored. But the utopian position in which there is no evil at all, if, if everything is perfect, as if there are giant strawberries, and well, imagine, forget of strawberries, imagine the size of a watermelon, right? You know, eight foot watermelons, right? I don't know how we'd get it into the refrigerator, but that's a different problem, right? At any rate, so this kind of assumption goes with the utopian perfection messianism, where there has to be a catastrophe, because only a catastrophe can eliminate all evildoers. That catastrophe is the war of the sons of light against the sons of darkness in the scroll. Christianity is opposite from beginning to end. I know there are some people who want to claim that it's really a revolutionary group. There's not one stitch of evidence. Christianity believes that the kingdom of God will come about by humans doing what they're supposed to do, and then shifts its belief that the kingdom of God comes about through the sacrifice of God's son, giving his life to provide redemption from all those, for all those who will believe in it. But it does not believe in this violent, catastrophic type of approach for the most part. I say for the most part, because there are aspects here or there in the New Testament that talk about tremendous destruction. And this approach has created what is called dispensationalism, which is a fundamental aspect of the belief of evangelical Christianity, which is an American movement developed in the United States, which does in many evangelicals expect that there will be a catastrophe bringing on the messianic era. Many evangelicals believe that that catastrophe will concern the Jewish people. Unfortunately, there already was a catastrophe concerning the Jewish people, but there are many evangelicals who think that that actually qualified and don't expect another catastrophe. This is a whole complicated question you should get some experts to talk to you about. I'm not sufficiently expert. But for the most part, the Jesus followers expected a peaceful transition to a kingdom of God and not this kind of a war, uh, a, a catastrophe. The Talmud contains both positions. And there are some later Jewish works that believe that there will be a great war for the onset of the Messianic era. Now, we want to pass to a work which is normative Judaism. And this is the Messianic Apocalypse. I actually mentioned this last week, which I shouldn't have done because I need it this week. But anyhow, just take a look at this text. The heavens and earth will listen to his Messiah, the anointed one. None therein will stray from the commandments of the Holy One. Seek of the Lord, strengthen yourself, right? But look what God's going to do. The Lord will consider the pious 
and call the righteous by name. Over the poor, his spirit will hover. Renew the faithful with his power. It will glorify the pious. He liberate the captives. Restore sight to the ground. Well, this sounds like the second paragraph of the Amida. Mechal Kel Chaim Bechesed. God provides sustenance to all. And what it means is that the expect, heal the wounded, revive the dead. This is what was expected to happen in the Messianic era by this very normative text. This perhaps may be a non-sectarian text. It expects, as you can see, one Messiah and expects that Messiah to do the things that traditional Judaism has always hoped for. So there's an example of a way in which the sectarians reflect the fundamentals of Judaism and do not seem to reflect any of the things that are distinctively Christian. But we have this document in Aramaic. Most Aramaic documents, probably all, in the Qumran collection are from before there was a Qumran sect. Because before the Maccabean rebellion, Aramaic was the more main language. The Maccabees revived Hebrew. Hebrew eventually retreated, and Aramaic became the language in the second, third, fourth centuries, even maybe even the first century already, started to become the main language. But for a while, Hebrew was really the language again. This Aramaic document has been called the Son of God text, because in column two at the top, it speaks of the Messiah as being called the Son of God, and they will call him the Son of the Most High, and goes on to describe how the Messiah will bring about uh, goodness and peace in the earth. The sword will cease from the earth in line six. Cities will pay him homage, and God will be recognized as a great war. But still, in line eight, you see that there has to be a war to bring the Messianic era. This is very Qumran-like. So now the question is, what is this Son of God thing? It's very clear that some Jews understood the term son of God as a term for the Messiah. And this may be an influence on the creation of the Christian understanding of the Messiah as the son of God, not the text we're looking at. Rather, this text as an idea that may have been more widely spread among Jews in the period of the second and first centuries BCE and may therefore have had an influence on Christianity. One should never look for direct influences, as I said before. Again, I'm trying to show you a mix, things that look like they might have influenced things that are opposite, because that's the way the situation really is here. Now I want to close by discussing some contemporary issues that relate to everything we've talked about. One of these is the early research that Christianized the scrolls. That's why I called my book Reclaiming the Dead Sea Scrolls, because at that time when I published the book, it was still an issue. It's a dead issue today. But I have to tell you, I give examples there of people using terms from monasteries to talk about the sectarians. They're in a monastery, they're monks, they have a refectory. And I gave an example in the book in which I just translated the same sentences into sort of Jewish yeshiva lingo, what they call Yinglish. And when you translate it into that, so it comes out totally different. If we say that they went to the, 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 the students in the yeshiva went to the dining room and they had, they said, they said hamotzi, they ate the meal and said birkata mazon, you're talking about a whole different thing. So there was this Christianization of the scrolls in an attempt to follow that second approach, I said, the assumption that the sectarians are proto-Christian. And we had the international team publishing the scrolls until they were put out of business, basically in the 19, early 90s and replaced by a real international and interconfessional, which means interreligious team, run by Emmanuel Tov at the Hebrew University, there were only Christians publishing the scrolls other than the ones that had been bought by Israel in the early 50s, which were, of course, published by Jews. But this, they, there was this constant interpretation of the areas where there, were messi where there were parallels to Christianity being given primary status, and there was very little talked about. But at the same time, there was another very positive trend because the evolution of Second Temple studies and early Christian rabbinic studies was to an interreligious group working together that was learning about each other's traditions to understand this very important period. And this interreligious uh, kind of cooperation, I would say certainly by the year 2000, which is 20 years ago already, certainly by the year 2000, had led to a very improved situation and to a whole generation of students and scholars understanding how the scrolls must be seen as early Judaism to use them to understand Christianity and that one should not confuse these two things. 
Now, at the same time, the scrolls have had a very positive effect on Jewish-Christian relations and the Jewish-Christian dialogue. A colleague of, of, of mine, uh, Eileen Schuler, who's a nun, has written, a very good Dead Sea Scrolls scholar, has written an article in which she quotes me as telling the story that I once heard from Samuel Ivry of Blessed Memory, who taught in Baltimore Hebrew College. He was a student of the great archaeologist William Foxwell Albright. And after Albright understood about the Dead Sea Scrolls, he told him, told Ivory that there would not have been a Holocaust if the scrolls had been discovered 10 years earlier. Now, this is false, totally false, right? The Nazis didn't care about the Dead Sea Scroll. But having said that, right, what Albright meant was that Jewish-Christian relations were advanced tremendously by the scrolls. And remember, they came right after the Holocaust. And the study of them and the emphasis on the Jewish origins of Christianity helped to feed the Vatican II and post-Holocaust rapprochement of Jews and Christians. I will just tell you in parenthesis that I sit on a committee called the International Jewish Committee for Interreligious Consultations that represents you to the Vatican, the World Council of Churches, the uh, international bodies of Eastern Orthodox Christianity. I absolutely represent the Orthodox Union there, but we all represent the Jewish people. So I have some involvement in this to see what's going on here. And the scrolls, therefore, have helped to reduce some of the ancient differences by emphasizing the role of the early Judaism in the formation of Christianity, but not directly with our sect. Our sect, like other Jewish groups, contributed in certain ways since Christianity derived from the Judaism of its time. And if we, we did last week, we showed how so many things in rabbinic Judaism came from there. So I want to conclude before opening to questions, by reading you a passage from the end of the MMT document, which whether it was a letter or not, looks like a letter that might have been sent or would have been sent by the leaders of the incipient sect to the leaders in Jerusalem. And this is what they wrote at the end of their letter, telling all their differences of Jewish law with the people running the temple. Also, we have written to you some of the precepts of the Torah, which we think are good for you and for your people. For in you we saw intellect and knowledge of the Torah. Reflect on all these matters and seek from him, from God, so that he, God, may support your counsel and keep far from you the evil scheming and the counsel of Belial. Belial, Hebrew Belial, is a Satan-like figure in scrolls and in Second Temple literature. So that at the end of time you may rejoice in finding that some of our words are true, and it shall be reckoned to you as justice when you do what is upright and good before him, for your good and that of Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, while people are thinking about some questions, uh, one question that came up in the chat was from Rabbi Linson asking, uh, maybe I'll change this question a little bit and hopefully get it, get it right. Does the concept of the money changers that you mentioned, um, does that come up at all any of the scrolls or, or, or writings that you found in, at, uh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls? I think I heard you right. I'm not sure, but it, the, the idea of the money changers does not come up in the scrolls at all. The reason that we know how that worked is because the Mishnah in Shkalim, which Shkalim means shekels, right? Like the modern Hebrew money, Shkalim, right? The uh, Mishnah explains all these procedures and how they worked and what would happen. So that's how we know about it. The uh, question of the money changer story has been understood by some scholars as the actual cause of his execution, which I don't think makes very much sense, but it has been explained that way by, by some, as I say. I think the question that uh, Rabbi Linton had was, does, it, does that, the money changes at all relate to the impurity or purity? So, no, in the scrolls, is it mentioned in the scrolls? No. Um, can you tell, so you've taught in different audiences, obviously um, when you're teaching in front of a Jewish audience, you'll present the materials one way. Do you have any stories of how you've taught this and reactions like in Rome or other places where you've, well, uh, lectured on this or any good stories to share in general about that? Well, if you go to my, if you go to my uh, website or if you search my name, you'll find my giving a lecture, which is not that far off from some of the stuff that we talked about here in uh, the, uh, in the uh, Biblical Institute of the Vatican in Rome. It's not really in the Vatican. It's a building that's half Vatican and half 
regular Rome, if you know anything about the way the Vatican works. But at any rate, if you walk through one half, you're in the Vatican, the other half, you're in Rome. I don't know what police work there. God forbid they need police. But anyhow, the thing is that I gave a lecture there, and you can see the my there. You'll know which that you got the right lecture, because me standing with a big cross on the wall next to me for the whole lecture, and you'll hear a very simple lecture. They loved it, because the point is that Christians today, who are scholars or intellectuals, understand the relationship of the scrolls and Second Temple Judaism to the rise of Christianity. So they, are, I'm sure they're Christians listening right, right here. And uh, this is the way educated Christians understand the same thing the way educated Jews do. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's always a the problem of what somebody who has a very narrow view of their own tradition would understand historically. That's where the problem goes. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish or Christian. They might not really understand what we're doing here, trying to, re to reconstruct a complex joint history. And there is a joint, a joint history. So I, I find that these views are well-received even sometimes by people who aren't so positive on uh, what most of us would consider to be some fundamental Jewish interests. But what happened really was the change took place. It, was, it took place in a certain sense in my generation of scholarship. And I was a part of it. And there are some particular Christian colleagues that were really doing the same thing. And they were doing it from a different side of knowledge of material. And what was going on was that there was basically an evolution out of this misunderstanding, which had been going on to a, a, a completely different way. I just tell you something funny. I said something once in a paper I gave at the Society for Biblical Literature, and a good friend of mine told me to leave it out of the published paper. So I did. He was right. But I could say it here because I could explain it. I said that anyone who steals the scrolls from the Jewish people steals them from the Christians. What do I mean by that? If you make the scrolls Christian, then you take away the most important set of sources to understand the background of Christianity. The minute you claim they're Christian, you've undone the value of the scrolls to understanding the background of Christianity. Christians want to know the background of Christianity. And there have been various simplistic theories, Hellenism, Eastern religion. Okay, so get rid of that. Now we have great sources, but we got to use them with balance and with sense. So I, I would say it's generally agreed to. You can go on internet and you can read to various Christian or Christians who are, you know, ministers and priests who write about the scrolls. You see the, the, the educated ones are operating in this direction. When uh, we talked, we just finished talking about how you have had experience talking to about the scrolls in Jewish and non-Jewish environments. How about within the Jewish world? You are you're Orthodox. Uh, you know, do you do you find that in the Orthodox world people are interested in anything like this, or is your is your um, audience primarily the non-Orthodox world? Um, you know, trying to explore early evolution of Judaism. Well, it's just a question of who invites you and when. For example, I. I write in a Hasidic-owned magazine sometimes about archaeology, right, that, that uh, Ami magazine. I write there about archaeology, sometimes about the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they, they want the articles, and they put them in, usually around holidays when they're looking for more stuff for people to read. And I often speak in Orthodox synagogues and Chabad houses. And uh, I'll just tell you a great story. So uh, because Williamsburg is between NYU and my home, now that people understand I don't live in Manhattan, so I often go to Jewish bookstores in Williamsburg. You know, the Williamsburg is all Satmar Hasidim. Anyhow, one day I was in a bookstore and I gave my charge card and I bought something. It was raining a little bit. A guy, two guys come running out after me. You're Professor Shipman. We watch you on television all the time. And, and, and I'll just tell you one other story. I once gave a lecture in Borough Park to 300 Hasidim, who by their hats looked like they were Bubaver and, and, and Bell's Hasidim. I gave a lecture to 300 of them on biblical archaeology. And then afterwards, I was standing there for an hour and a half outside talking to about 25 of them who were very interested. So I, I think that there's interest all over the place. And it just depends. You know, there are, there are many Jewish people who couldn't care less about details of their history and background. And there are many Christians and many Orthodox, Reformed Jews, conservative Jews, all kinds of people that are interested and the ones who are not. You talk a little about the Son of God and that, that document you mentioned because it is a challenging concept and obviously prevalent in Christianity, yet not so much in our contemporary understanding of Judaism. So anything more you can add to that, where it came from, yeah, its roots? Something for us, which is that 
some articles by Catholic scholars who want to claim that this is not a discussion of the Messiah, because they want to claim that there was no terminology like that in Judaism, but rather the claim they want to make, and there were some articles by very good scholars saying this, but believe me, it's not true. They wanted to claim that this is a boasting Hellenistic king. I am the son of God. I'm a big shot, right? It's not. It's a, a prefiguration of some kind of a messiah. And so now we end up with the historical question. Did Christianity take this idea from a pre-existent Jewish system of what we call in scholarly terms eschatology, which means messianism, you know, end of days, eschaton mean the end. Or it, it, did, did they get it on their own coming up with this idea that the Messiah could be the Son of God. But remember that Israel is called the Son of God, and there are various places, for example, David, right, has a vision, and, and God says to him, you are my son, my firstborn. So the truth is that this is an old Jewish idea that's coming in this text in a certain admittedly changed way to refer to the Messiah specifically. And then the question is, was Christianity influenced by this kind of idea or not? We don't know, but there are some Catholic scholars and then perhaps some other scholars of other groups of Christianity, but I actually don't know specific articles who want to deny that this is even talking about the Messiah because they need to, to argue for the uniqueness of the Christian belief here. And what one of the things the scrolls do show, and furthermore, if you study enough other Jewish texts from the period and the Apocrypha, what we call the Pseudepigrapha, other documents that are preserved in Latin and Greek, other things, you see that uh, nothing is as unique as somebody might want to believe. Um, so what's the next big thing coming out on the Dead Sea Scrolls? I know you, your book we talked about, but what's, what you, 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 you read a lot. Right, yeah, look, well. the, the, I think that one of the things that's been happening that I'm uh, very pleased at is I recently was catching up on an area that I hadn't done a lot of work on recently. And I read some things catching up on the new developments in archeology. span because for years, even though the scrolls had been published, the archeological material from the excavations was not published, and much of it was not even in condition to be just used, and we've had some fine new scholars come into the picture and produce a lot of good work. And that work is going to be mostly appreciated technically. If you have a lecture though, you'll get it boiled down for you, but it's gonna appreciate it technically, but it says a lot about various specifics that people want to know want to know just as a small example i'm just i'm finishing literally now i was just my wife's been helping me at this and she was i was giving her some references on it a, an article about the mikvaot the ritual baths at qumran and their connection to purity law in the dead sea scrolls and here i'm reading much finer research than i had before due to recent excavations and more than excavations, recent studies of the old excavations, which provide a window on the situation, which is far superior to what, what we had before. And even here, we may have some scholarly disagreement. So that's an important thing. And there's been some re-excavation of some of the caves. And I would say that those are uh, among the most important things. And we've all, all heard some of the news about the scientific work that's been done on various aspects of the scrolls and uh, things that I think are at their very beginnings and are likely to help us, development of programs, for example, that could check out where little fragments that weren't identified, perhaps where they belong and, and stuff like that. And I would say that the, the field is moving ahead. One of the big challenges of the field is to assimilate its findings into the general study of Judaism and Christianity in a time when many scholars see the scrolls field as too technical to get into. And, and that's kind of unfortunate because there's a lot to be gained in many fields from the scrolls. My last question goes back to something you talked about last week, which is the discovery of the tefillin that were there and that's still being analyzed. I think the scrolls are there. In fact, there was an article that I found that's a few years old talking about the discovery of the tefillin and that they had, they, they call them like the smallest Dead Sea Scrolls because of the, the actual parchment in the film. So my I, question, I, yeah. I, I didn't hear everything you said. Unfortunately, the audio isn't good enough, but I think I know what you want me to talk about. So I'll give it a try, and if it's not, you'll tell me. So we have from Qumran quite a number of what we call fill and slips. That's the text. That's what's called in Hebrew, klafim, which you know means like pieces of parchment. And uh, also the batim, the outside container. 
Now, these are about three-eighths of an inch. What's happened in the last couple of years is that they identified what they thought were crushed cases that actually have the text inside. And now there's an attempt to read those with various new technological uh, tools. The truth is that for the public, this doesn't really matter. Because we already know that at Qumran, the tefillin boiled down to the two kinds, the one that's exactly the contents of modern tefillin based on the rabbinic Talmudic same tradition, and the ones that have those texts, but maybe start a little before or end a little bit after. And hence, that means that we have Shema Yisrael, Deuteronomy 6.5, and that whole passage, you shall love the Lord your God, hero Israel, you love the Lord your God. You can also have the Ten Commandments, which is right above it. And that is something of importance because there's various rabbinic argumentation about the role of the Ten Commandments in early Judaism. But beyond that, the most important thing here with the tefillin, the mikvaot, the physical way scrolls are made is that what we're seeing here is what scholars call common Judaism. That we also have tefillin from the Bar Kokhba caves. We remember that also. And what these show is that there was a kind of common Judaism. No matter what sect you're in, you have your tefillin. Right? And, and besides you have your tefillin, you have your scrolls and, and mikvaot. These seem to be all made in a similar kind of way. And this kind of common Judaism is something that people all, all the time forget, just because people have all these sectarian differences. And that's one of the things that emerges here. Also, they're very small because apparently they wore them all day. Now, I did see somebody write that uh, the existence of tefillin proved that they were doing prayer on a regular basis. This is actually not relevant because they were wearing them all day. They became something you wear in prayer when Jews stopped wearing them all day. And exactly when that happened, I can't tell you, but that's one of the reasons why they're so small. Because if you're wearing them all day and you want to go to work, you can't have these big boxes sticking off your head and on your arm, right? You got to have smaller ones. So at any rate, though, uh, it's, when you see these tefillin, let me just say that there's, there's a kind of message when you see something like the tefillin or the mikvah, that there's a message of continuity of Judaism. And I think you also got that when I showed you the big piece of the Isaiah scroll. And it's like a Torah scroll in a synagogue today, the, the physical nature of it, not the, the, when you see these things, you also, I think, come to an understanding how clever it was of the rabbis throughout the ages as Judaism developed into books, codices first, copying of manuscripts, but codices like books, and then the development of printing to keep the scroll going. And I remember seeing a, a rabbi who wrote that maybe you could make a scroll with a silk screen and saying to myself, boy, does this guy not understand what the Torah scroll means in Judaism? The idea that there's a handwritten text, yeah, it might have errors, now they check it with a computer, but the idea of that continuity, you see when you look at these ritual objects. And I'll just say that they also get that feeling, I know when, when, the scribe, when these, these scrolls were first taken away from the people who didn't publish them, and I was invited to join the team, and I went with a colleague and we sat there. In the early days, you could touch the scrolls, which is nuts, before the, the, the conservators came along. These wonderful women that had worked as conservators of papyri in Russia before they came to Israel, and they took over the scrolls. They said, you're not touching anything. It's all going in special containers when you look at it. Before that, you could touch it. Imagine you're touching a Jewish scroll from 2,200 years ago. So there's a, somehow or another, there's a feeling of continuity here that's different just when you go to an archeological site and you realize that this is the place where your forefathers actually were, but touching it in your hand is another story. But don't do it, don't touch any scroll. I think that's a great way to end. So thank you so much for a terrific three-part series, bringing the scrolls to life, uh, to relevancy. Um, you know, I thought we'd, uh, we'd get to understand all of the scrolls and what we now understand is a little bit more of the scrolls. So, we have to come to New York and take a uh, full year or many years of study with you to get to really understand everything. But you gave us a taste. You gave us depth. So for that, uh, I thank you. I thank everybody for participating. I hope you enjoyed the three-part series. Um, I'm glad that we've recorded it. And if you discover anything new, you'll email me right away so I can tell the group before it gets in the newspaper or CNN, right? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Professor Schiffman. Have a great day. Keep safe. Keep cool. Thank you very much. Same to everybody. Take care. We'll see you this week. Lots of programs, guys. Faith Hirschler, lots of programs. Looking forward to seeing you. Bye, Hunter. Bye, guys. Linda, I can see Linda Greenberg. Have a good one.
Bye, Rosella. Bye, Ada. See you soon.